the Hoagling Health Department is still being slammed over plans not to renew contracts of health workers who were appointed as the country battled the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. At a briefing this week, officials said they've been left with no choice but to let the workers go because the department simply doesn't have the money to keep them on its payroll. The initial allocation of more than 2 billion rand has been cut in half for the year 2022-2023. That's the financial period. Up to 800 workers could lose their jobs at Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital alone. Despite that, and the more than 4 billion rand owed to debtors, the Gauteng Health Department says it is not in a financial crisis. We're joined this afternoon by MEC Nomatemba Mocheti, who's with us in studio here. MEC, uh, very good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for coming in. Let's begin with the issue of, of the workers, these contract workers who will not be renewed. How many will actually be affected? Okay. Thank you very much, Tembegile. Good afternoon to yourselves and good afternoon to your viewers. Yeah, on the workers that are going to, um, uh, which contracts are going to be terminated on the 31st of March, um, these um, contract workers were appointed uh, at different stages of the waves. So when we look into the entire province, we have to date appointed close to 8,500 workers. But the, eight, the 800, 812 is only for Bara. Mm -hmm. And we are not saying we are laying off all the 812 uh, workers or contract workers that were appointed on a grant, uh, uh, which is called COVID grant. It's mm -hmm. not from the equitable share. So what, what is going to happen is that um, they have to, like the CEOs, have to um, prioritize. Like for instance, at Para, they've got 33 doctors appointed. They've already consulted. Only 28 doctors have said they, they can be happy if their contracts can be renewed. And then with the nurses, is more than 260. Uh, nurses. I'm not talking about other workers, your allied workers, your mm -hmm. contacts and so forth. So what's going to happen is that um, the CEOs will have to sit with the clinicians and then prioritize. And then they have also came up with a strategy to say if um, a, a smaller hospital like Bethacoa does not need more COVID posts on their allocation, that uh, those posts can be transferred to Barra so that they can be able to, 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 to mesh up because of the closure of Charlotte. So they are pressured when it comes to a, a patient care on so a daily basis. realistically, if 8,000 in overall provincial contracts were mm. signed throughout the course of the pandemic, mm. there's a two-year window, how many realistically will you be able to keep? Because that is what's giving people sleepless nights. Yes. They don't know if they're coming or going. Yes, it's true. Uh, people are having sleepless nights. They call me during, maybe even in the middle of the night to say, I can't sleep because I'm not sure what is going to happen. But what we're going to do as government, we, as government, we're going to make sure that we keep as much as possible a number of healthcare workers because uh, we know that uh, the, the, the organi organizational structures of different hospital, hospitals does not cater for the intake of, of patients. So these contracts uh, um, will be renewing uh, those that we know that they are critical, but the hospital CEOs and clinicians must be able to say, we are prior prioritizing these category of, of healthcare workers. So when do the last of the, these contracts expire? 31st of March. So we are on the, the 13th of March and your department, MEC, still doesn't have a clear number of who's going or staying. Surely that is unfair and some would even argue incredibly cruel to workers who don't know if come the 31st they won't have a job. Mm -mm. What happens is that this is a fixed term contract which has a beginning and end. And then by law we have to inform them that by the 31st your contract will end because if we are not doing that we'll be in breach uh, of contract. So what happened is that two weeks ago, the department met and then the CFOs were given the, the task. That is why I'm able to tell you uh, the breakdown of BARA because mm. they have already worked on their priorities. So where they are running short of uh, healthcare workers or because the doctors, it's, it's a given, they are going to be renewed. Then 
uh, by the 25th, they will have to come back and then tell us that we are keeping these uh, employees and then we'll then draft contracts and then give them new contracts and would have informed those that are not coming back already that their contracts are ending the 31st of But is it not, is it not clumsy of the department and the hospitals to have left this to the last minute? Why could it not have been done, this consolidation of what's needed and what's not? Why could it not be finalized perhaps in January when you knew that in two months you'd have to be making these tough decisions? It doesn't work like that, Tembegile. There's a process of a uh, budgeting process. Mm. So where the department sit and then prioritize their needs and then, uh, then present to the budget uh, a committee, then the budget committee will then, for instance, as a department, we have motivated that we need uh, 2.2 billion so that we can be able to retain the majority of these mm. uh, COVID uh, 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 posts. But after all the other departments, remember it's not only health uh, that needs that allocation. The motivation from the, 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 the um, uh, budget committee was that the numbers of uh, COVID infections are declining. And uh, we, you, as a department, you are no longer having the pressures that you had. So now, the reason why we are cutting that budget into half, we are saying to you, go and reprioritize and, and, and then allocate within that amount that we, we have allocated. So mm. we will be able to, to retain more than 50%. But the challenge, I suppose, the MEC, to many of us, especially people who use public health care in this country is that you know that yes these are workers who are brought in for COVID-19 related treatment and services right but these are hospitals in Gauteng where we do hear uh, of long waiting hours for people who are going in for day appointments you still hear of uh, a worrying nurse or doctor to patient ratio mm. which then clearly says that there is a need for more hands and that is why many South Africans are finding it difficult to reconcile what you are laying out and their reality when they walk into hospitals even before COVID. Yes, that's true. And, uh, and as government, we are trying our best to make sure that we come up with plans to also increase the staff. Remember, uh, this, the, all the hospitals are working according to their organizational structure and the population of how thing is increasing like yearly. Mm. So the structure was designed at that time, like for, for Barra, they, if you want to have Barra functional, you must have more than 7,000 uh, doctors and nurses. And how many do you have now? More than 6,000. So it's a shortfall. Yes. So we do understand. And the other thing is the, the bed capacity. The bed capacity of Barra is more than 2,600. So at that time, when the structure was designed, that was enough to can take care of the patients there. But we, no, we, we are reviewing our organizational structure so that it can be aligned with the, the pressures uh, in different hospitals. Mm. So unfortunately, it's a process. It's like the budget. That is why uh, we had to, 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 to abide to the contractual obligation, inform the staff, everyone, that your contract will be ending on the 31st. Mm. And then why is are still embarking on the process? Because you don't just uh, 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 put people on a post that is not funded. Okay. So that, that process of budgeting process, us motivating, going back, cut here, increase here, that is the reason why we ultimately got uh, 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 from tre Treasury that we are allocated 1.1 billion to look into the COVID posts, those that are critical, those that have been prioritized by facilities, and then so that they can, their, their contracts can be renewed. There have been a lot of healthcare workers who've been speaking about this issue. I'd like us to take a listen now to Professor Richard Netononda, the head of cardiology at Chris Hadi Barakana's academic hospital, speaking earlier this week. Enough is enough, comrades. Yeah. We are sick and tired of a government that we put to power that find it very easy and very easy to quickly dish out money to those who want to uh, commit acts of corruption. But getting money to help poor people, just to help us to get by, to get staff to treat our patients, to get food for our patients to eat, to get milk for babies. So the prof there says they're sick and tired of money being taken, state funds being taken for corruption to, or to benefit corrupt people, yet healthcare workers and patients essentially are suffering. 
and you were just talking about how you were given a slashed allocation mm -hmm. budget-wise. What could be more important than health care in Gauteng? Uh, there's nothing that could be more important than healthcare in Gauteng. And um, I must say, Tembegile, during COVID, uh, um, w we had to reprioritize. Budget has to be taken from other departments. Other programs had to suffer because we had to prioritize uh, COVID uh, because of the pandemic. So there's really nothing that is important than the healthcare in, in, in Gauteng. And hence, we have been motivating uh, to, for the increase of budget, but unfortunately, other programs also had to, to, to also be taken care of. Other programs within health has also uh, been able to, to, to be taken care of. So I don't dispute the fact that uh, uh, health is a priority in Gauteng, mm -hmm. and but we only have this much budget because we have to share it with other departments, your department, your education, your uh, infrastructure, your your um, department of sports, community services. So w that's how we had been, uh, 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 we made other programs to suffer during the hardcore, uh, uh, during the COVID uh, 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 pandemic. But now the, the, the argument is that the numbers are now lower. You don't have the pressure that you had with the previous waves. So let's give other departments as well mm -hmm. a priority so that they can also run their programs because they had to stop their programs and then we had to be prioritized. So if you're saying you can only retain, I think, about 50%, more than 50%, more than 50 of the mm -hmm. workers, so if it's 8,000 contracts in total, maybe close to 5,000 will be able to stay more on the job. More than 5,000. More than 5,000, but mm -hmm. ultimately maybe 3.5 will have to go. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do as the Gauteng Department when some of your most experienced uh, healthcare workers leave, either to leave the country or to work in the private sector because they're saying the conditions are unbearable. The employment of, of these COVID-19 workers had actually allowed them mm -hmm. to work in a functional environment where they weren't constantly overwhelmed by the volume of patients, volume of emergencies. Yes, as, as I said earlier, we, we are currently working on a plan to say those who don't need a uh, this post as much as the ones like your Barra, your big hospitals, your Barra, Dr. George Mukari, Charlotte Matreke, will get a bigger share. And there is a possibility that uh, you might retain almost all of the healthcare workers. But mm. with the other categories like your porters, your admin uh, uh, staff that was uh, appointed, your cleaners that were appointed, remember we had pressure then. We had a lot of patients coming to, the, to our hospitals. So we needed more porters then. But now that the numbers are low, so it means our priority would be on the healthcare workers and other categories of health, your radiologists, your psychologists, and um, many others that were appointed uh, uh, by the, during that time when, when we had COVID. I was referring mainly to healthcare workers who will be retained but are going to quit now out of frustration with the increase in workload. Which was the ones that we... <clears throat> Excuse me, those who are saying, I'm staying, mm. but the conditions become so unbearable under the old normal before COVID that they simply don't want to stay and work with, for you anymore. They'd rather go into private health care or take up jobs in other parts of the world because it just is not an environment that is conducive to them performing at their best. But I don't think, it, for me, it's, it's still premature for us to say, to, for them to say they are leaving because uh, we are not taking care of them. We are laying off uh, 812 uh, 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 health care workers. It is not all the 812 that will be laid off. Mm. It's, it's only those categories of uh, uh, positions that are not needed as much as the healthcare workers. So for me, I, I, I think they should have given, given us time so that they can see uh, how are we going to deal with this matter. Mm. And other than that, we do have nursing agencies where uh, we procure nurses uh, from the, the, the agencies and then uh, uh, sometimes uh, when we see that there's a lot of patients that are maybe admitted and then we can be able to get that extra uh, help from, from, from the agencies. And, and I mean, we're talking a lot about the healthcare workers, but as you were saying, there are a lot of admin workers, porters, mm. cleaners who are going to go. Mm. And many of those people, the reality is, we're a part of a, a labor segment in this country where they either un considered unskilled or with very low skill levels and will likely become unemployed for longer than a year. 
remember, this is not our baseline mm. budget. It is a grant. For, it was a COVID grant and not from the equitable share. And we will be having, remember from our baseline, if we will be having vacant positions, that will be advertising. But it, even if it will not be able to take all of them, I'm encouraging them to apply for those positions when they're advertised. Mm -hmm. Because w w the fact is these were contract posts. They were for a limited period. It was from a, a, from the 1st of a, April last year to the 31st of March. It was always March. going to end on yes, paper. Yes, And they knew when they were signing the contract. Some of them came in the middle of the contract, like six months before the contract ends. At Barra, it's even worse. There are those that came in now. I think their three months will be ending on the 31st of March. Mm. And unfortunately, we have to do that because if we're not going to, to terminate or or, or, or inform them that their contracts will be terminating. We will be in breach of contract. Let's move on to another issue. You owe service providers to the tune of 4 billion rand, right? That, that's what you owe your debtors. Mm -hmm. What guarantee can you as the Houghton Health MEC give people in this province that that debt will not in any way compromise your ability to care for the sick and vulnerable? Um, Tembekile, these... Initially, it was 5.2 billion when I got into the department. And then after all the reconci reconciliation and the verification, because some of the invoices were duplicated, we then came to a uh, 4.2 billion that we owe service providers. And this 4.2 billion is dating back from 2013. It is not one financial year. So we are working to reduce and uh, I must say we, 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 we went to, uh, uh, to the Portfolio Committee of Finance on Friday and we presented. They, they also acknowledged that the department has challenges, uh, financial mm -hmm. uh, uh, constraints, and they also acknowledged that we, we do have these uh, 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 accruals. But they also appreciate the fact that from 5.2 billion, we managed to reduce that in a year to 4.2 billion. And you've said you're not in a financial crisis. No, if you owe debtors 4.2 billion now, as you say, what would, how would you describe, how, or how would you define a crisis? At what point would you say this is a crisis? When we can't uh, uh, pay the essential services, your blood, uh, uh, lab test, your food, your uh, 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 linen, and so forth. But those are the ones that we're prioritizing. Remember that the debt that, uh, that is dating mm. back to 2013. So we can't pay all the accruals. We have an agreement with the service providers to say, yes, we have, we have agreed with you, this is what we owe you, and this is how we're going to pay you. What about the issue then of medical waste removal? Because there have been reports that that's not been disposed of correctly. Yes, it, but now that has been resolved. Uh, remember when the, when the department is big as the Department of Health, and department owing a number of service providers. Towards the end of the financial year, everybody submit their invoices they want to be paid. Mm -hmm. And it's a process. It's, it, you, you capture the invoice from the facility, and then that in, invoice will then be verified and then be captured in the Department of Health, and then the Treasury Department is the one that is uh, uh, paying. So we we pay them every month, and then uh, because we were heading towards the end of the financial year. They wanted to be paid, and then they said, if we're not going to pay them, they, they will withheld their, their, their services. But that has since been resolved. The, the waste is being removed in all the hospitals. I'd like to listen to a gentleman we had on the channel earlier today. He actually owns a butchery. He was speaking to my colleague, Ayanda Nyati, about a, a, a call that he got from a healthcare worker at Chris Honey Barakanath Hospital. This was at the time when there were issues with the supply of bread for patients. Take a listen. The situation was critical. So um, what we decided was, uh, we spoke to a few people at Bella. We then decided, you know, we, we will we'll try and do what to what. We don't know what the situation is there. So we, we prepared sandwiches and uh, we, we got uh, a few hundred loaves of bread uh, to, to dispatch there. Uh, so I think it was on Tuesday that we went there and we, we, we gave uh, the sandwiches to the people and the bread. And, and then, you know, subsequently we heard that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a bread, there's a shortage of bread there. And uh, we started taking it further. Mm. And then we were, we were approached by management.
uh, who took us in for a meeting and things were discussed there. Let me see, the, the gentleman there says as, as recently as Monday, Tuesday, they were still delivering bread to, to Barra. I know that the hospital CEO had said that patients were not being starved and there were still those who have diabetes, for example, and need to eat frequently were still being offered something to eat. But the fact that workers at the hospital were reaching out to business people to say, can you please bring us something, bring us sandwiches, implies that there was a very serious problem. Something had gone wrong. Um, maybe to start off by saying there's a process uh, if you're going to donate anything at the hospital there's a process that needs to be followed and uh, delivering sandwiches to the patients is not allowed because if they can be food poisoning who's going to be held accountable so I know of this um, uh, um, NGO that was uh, apparently wanted to to, to, to supply bread mm. and they, they, they said they supplied bread during the time when uh, uh, we had uh, COVID, uh, a lot of COVID patients. Bara is, is using 540 loaves per day and when the, the service provider started withholding the, 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 the supply of bread, supplying but not uh, the whole 540, they started using the what is it, the, 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 the petty cash mm. to can be able to buy bread. But at some point, because they were also following up with head office, that how far is the payment? The payment of uh, the service provider was in a run. So it was, uh, it was still, need, it, it still needed to be, to be released. Mm. And then w what happened is that uh, we also heard that the, the patient, the, 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 the hospital staff, the nurses that were working in, mm. in, in those was, uh, wards, because normally they, they issue them with eight loaves of bread. It's a snack. It's not like patients were starved. Patients well, I, I understand that patients are not being starved, let me see. I'm, I'm just jumping in here because we are pressed for time. Patients are not starved, you say, but I'm, what the point I'm making is if there was a point where nurses felt compelled to buy bread on their own or were calling businesses that they knew to say, please, can you send us a few loaves of bread? That implies that there was a problem and that they had looked at the situation and assessed that it could not continue in the way that it was. Nurses were not forced to, to, to ask for donations. Patients were, according to our dietitian, as, as a di if you are diabetic, you have to have a snack uh, sometime, maybe three times or so during the day. But what, 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 what is happening is that they preferred bread, even though they were given uh, apples, they were given yogurt, they were given low IG mahew, but they, there are those that preferred bread. So even though uh, 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 they were given uh, whatever that was given as a snack, because mm -hmm. it is not like they, 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 they live on bread. They, have, they had their breakfast, their lunch, their dinner, because we did not run out of uh, groceries uh, uh, in the hospital. So they preferred bread. For those who preferred bread, I think the, out of uh, the, 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 the love of the patients, the nurses, then uh, 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 buy bread for them. But they were not forced to do it. But fundamentally, there was a problem if majority of patients would prefer to have bread and bread is not available. But there is a snack. Uh, that bread is used as a snack. And there is an alternative snack that was given to them. Is, uh, is an apple as filling as bread? You, 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 in fact, when you are a diabetic, you don't have to, to, to eat a lot of bread. You need to, to change your snack. Mm. You need to take an apple, you need to take yogurt, you need to take uh, 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 any other. So why then was this much bread being given out in the first place if that's not even the healthiest option? It, I'm not saying it's, the, it's, the healthier, it's not the healthiest option, but if there is an alternative, if there's no bread and you are given an alternative, of a snack. Mm. It doesn't mean that you did not have a snack. Okay. But our people prefer bread over your apple that you can snack with, over your macheu that you can snack with. Let's talk about the Cuban doctors. Um, we're told, we're reading that the Houghton Health Department is paying about 14 Cuban doctors anything between 78,000 rand and 90,000 rand each. That's their income. What are they doing? What are they doing that you would not be able to achieve with just local doctors? Um, I, we, we no longer have those, remember those Cuban doctors that were 
assisting us mm. during COVID. We had a contract with them for a specific period. And when that contract ended, Gauteng did not retain uh, those uh, uh, Cuban doctors. So they've all gone? Yes. But My understanding is that they've all gone. We did not, because I know it was also an issue of a contractual obligation. We wanted, uh, they wanted us to retain them, but we said no, because it was a contractual obligation. It has terms and conditions. It has specific time. So it had, it ended when it's supposed to be ended. But why did we need them in the first place? What did, what did they do that you could not have done with just South African doctors or your regular staff? It was just an extra hand, and uh, the, 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 the agreement that we have with, with the Cuban uh, 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 government. So they, 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 have, uh, uh, they, they are using a different uh, approach in terms of uh, providing health care. Mm -hmm. So I think then, because I was not part of the system then. What is the return on investment? What can we point to now in the health care system and say this is what the Cubans taught us? and what we're able to carry forward to care for South Africans who come into our hospitals? I think I'll not be able to, to answer that one because I was not working directly with them. They were working with uh, different clinicians in, in uh, different uh, uh, facilities. But what I know is that when we still had that field hospital, Nazrek, I, I used to go there, they used to, to they, they had uh, family doctors because uh, a lot of patients were going under stress, they had psychologists, mm. they had uh, different uh, uh, categories of But we've got psychologists here as well. I mean, I, I appreciate that you may not be able to be presenting an assessment for each and every one of the Cuban doctors. I think it was 28 initially was the number, mm -hmm. and then down to 14 at some point, if mm -hmm. uh, some of the articles have the facts correct. Uh, but given the level of scrutiny for the introduction of Cuban doctors into the system, whether it's an agreement between the South African government and their government uh, or not, Surely there should have been mechanisms in place to say, let's measure what this investment has brought us, precisely because you're in a country where people need work, including doctors who say, well, we didn't get a call. We were willing to go in and work. There are many South African doctors who were calling into talk radio stations saying, why don't they call me up? I'm willing to work and I'm willing to do it for less than 78,000 or 90,000 rand a month. As I said, I was not here. And... Uh I, am, I did not work directly with them, but I think if you need that information, we will be able to give it to in you. In hindsight, do you think it was fair, though, to bring them in at 78,000, 90,000 rand a pop, given that there were South African doctors who were willing to do the job? I cannot answer that because uh, I don't know what was the reason why they were brought into the country. The only thing that I know is this agreement that we have with the Cuban doctors, with the Cu Cuban government, and there might have been good reasons then to bring them into the country to but come and assist. see, if there were good reasons with respect, then we'd be able to say this is what they, they were able to do, which is what I'm trying to assess now in hindsight two years after the pandemic. I will be able to give you that information if I can be given an opportunity to go and check the impact because that I did not uh, mm. uh, have when I came here. Okay. MEC, we're going to leave it there. You and I will, will catch up and discuss some of these issues further. For now, thank you so much for your time. MEC Nomatemba Mukheti, who's the health MEC in Gauteng, will return.